So everybody has uh, started their talks by thanking the organizers. And I too want to thank the organizers, but I think who hasn't gotten a shout out is the cooks. I mean, the food of this conference has been absolutely incredible. So I don't know uh, if, if that reaches them back there, but I want to thank the, the chefs who have been in charge. Um, it's, a, it's a real um, honor to be here, and specifically it's an honor to be in the philosophical section. I'm, I'm by no means um, a, a philosopher, but I do think it's somewhat appropriate to be in this section because I'm, I'm, coming, from this, I'm coming to this field from a very different vantage point. So in my group, we study the evolution of cooperation and punishment. So we study how cooperation evolves and, uh, and how organisms react in partnerships when one of the partners defects from their mutualistic duties. So what happens in situations like that? And what we've seen so far in this conference is incredibly, incredibly elegant examples of symbiosis where we've seen intertwined genomes, all these um, data on complementary metabolic networks, and, uh, and we see so far the way that in the examples, the, the interests of the two partners, if you can even still call them that, are incredibly aligned. Right? The interests become incredibly aligned. Now, I'm coming from this in a very, very different way and studying symbiosis as conflict instead and sort of focusing on the idea that organisms are incredibly selfish. So why would you, why would you expend resources? Why would, why would any, any organism expend resources to benefit another partner if those resources could be redirected to one's own fitness? And so the two... Um, the two model systems that, that my lab has been working on in, in the recent years, the ones I'm going to talk about today, are these rhizosphere mutualisms, so partnerships um, that happen below ground. And we study mycorrhizal fungi, so these are these fungi, really ancient, ancient um, symbiosis that evolved some 450 million years ago. So these are the mutualists that, that helped, um, at least one of the, the running um, hypotheses is that these fungi help land plants uh, first of all, come out of the water by being able to extract nutrients from, uh, from rock. And in this symbiosis, you have the plant giving carbon in exchange for phosphorus and nitrogen and other benefits. And then also the rhizobial symbiosis. So these aren't, these aren't by any means new symbioses, but they're not completely integrated. Instead, what we see is this sort of relentless conflict. And that's what our group is interested in, is studying this relentless conflict. So the partners may benefit under certain situations, but they're very, very far from being integrated. And the thing about um, rhizosphere symbiosis that's so interesting is that uh, they're horizontally transmitted. So again, this is very different from what we see in, in things like organelles. Um, they can survive outside of the host. Um, for instance, with, a, with the mycorrhizal fungi, they, they are obligate in the sense that they need carbon from the host, but they can survive, let's say, as spores, resting spores in the soil. Um, they're also an interesting model system because there's this lack of genetic uniformity. So they really vary in how good they are as partners, how much resources that they'll actually provide um, to, to their host. And what we see, and I think this is, this is why this uh, question is, is really interesting from an evolutionary point of view, is that in all these cases, we see multiple strains per host. So you have the potential for a tragedy of the commons where one strain um, is perhaps free riding on others that are providing benefits, yet it's still benefiting from being on a healthy host. So these are all reasons that, that we don't expect cooperation to evolve, yet we do see that these symbioses are quite old. And so the question that I want to ask today is, can you, can you take a model system like that, like these rhizosphere symbioses where you see this relentless conflict, and ask, can they be compared to other systems, like we see with aphids and buchnera, for example, where we go from this huge continuum of conflict to intertwined uh, genomes? And I think that there's three main problems in, in studying these, these kinds of questions and actually trying to get a grapple on what conditions lead to integration. And I think one of, the, one of the first main problems is that we know how to identify the end state, right? We can, 
We still have a hard time defining, okay, what is, a, what is an organelle versus an endosymbiont. We can sort of understand, we can sort of identify when something is stable and it's become more integrated. Um, but it's hard to understand the transition or it's hard to, to, to uh, identify the, transi the, the steps in that transition. Um, in many cases, it's very difficult to actually look back in deep evolutionary time to see when these transitions towards integration took place. And I think one of the last sort of major problems is trying to understand this process towards integration is that there's no really good comparative framework across different symbiotic systems, right? So we all have different systems that we study, but if we want to understand really the processes of integration, there's no real comparative way that we can do that. So what I want to talk about today is sort of two approaches that we're using in my group um, that try to address those problems and understand that road towards integration. Um, and here are the two approaches. The one is trying to identify, is there some sort of evolutionary signature of integration? Is there some way that we can somehow quantify this integration? And, um, and the next uh, approach is studying organisms across a gradient of integration. And I think we can do that in rhizosphere symbioses. So the first one I want to talk about is this evolutionary signature. So, um, and here I'm going to focus on the legume rhizobia symbiosis. So we see that symbiosis is lost and gained multiple times. It's a very dynamic process. Um, and especially in, in this symbiosis between legumes and rhizobia, there's many cases where the symbiosis has been gained and lost, and in other lineages it's been gained and lost, and we have all of this sort of uh, data about um, multiple lineages and, and how they react with the symbiosis, but our lab wanted to try to develop some sort of quantitative phylogenetic approach to analyze when it becomes less dynamic and more stable. And so what you need to be able to, to sort of grapple with that and understand, okay, can we quantify when a symbiosis becomes more stable, is you need some sort of comprehensive phylogeny. And this is where working on this particular mutualism is really useful. Um, you need a database of the trait of interest. So for us, we're interested in um, the symbiosis, the nitrogen-fixing symbiosis, so this, this, this symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And you need some sort of reconstruction model, method, to look back in time and see, okay, well, when was this trait, when did this trait evolve? And, uh, and, and, um, and being able to, to quantify when specific um, events, major events took place in the evolution of this trait. So the first thing I want to talk about is this reconstruction method. And it's a, it's a new class of models called a hidden rate models and HRMs. Now what's nice about using these models to try to reconstruct the evolutionary history of a symbiosis is that it lets you, um, it, it focuses on this idea that there's this heterogeneity in the speed of evolution. So a lot of these previous models uh, assumed one homogeneous rate of evolution over an, in huge entire clades of plants. And these new models allow for, for different rates of evolution. And that makes sense because different plant clades, let's say, are going to evolve traits at different speeds. And so what else this model lets you do is it, it introduces the possibility of intermediate steps before the origin of the trait itself. Now this is what's really key. If we're, if we're studying the phenotypes of symbiosis, let's say in this symbiosis between legumes and, and rhizobia, their nitrogen-fixing symbionts, we see the end result, right? We can see, okay, this is definitely a plant uh, species that uh, is able to make a symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. We can see the end result. But what we don't see are those steps towards integration, those steps towards the evolution of that symbiosis. So what this new approach lets us do is actually study those intermediate steps. So just here's a, here's a very quick uh, hypothetical model of what this would look like. Let's say you've got an ancestral state, which is a free living state, a plant that is unable to make um, a, a mutualistic association with these particular bacteria. Now, this model allows you to look at different states towards uh, the total integration. Here we've got in the upper right hand uh, corner where you see an, a totally integrated symbiosis. Now, a plant, and over evolutionary time, plant clades are going to go through these different 
uh, levels towards evolving the symbiosis. They're going to move from ancestral to some state where we can call this sort of a precursor state, where something in the plant allows it, let's say, to become more associated with um, a free living symbiont. And once it acquires that state, then perhaps it can move to another state where it actually evolves the nitrogen-fixing phenotype. So now it moves into a different rate class, and this is where the plant is actually in symbiosis. And once it's associating with those plants, and let's say these are different, here you see the arrows stand for the transition states, uh, the rates between these different classes. And here you've got lots and lots of dynamic processes where, the, where uh, particular clades evolve the symbiosis and lose it, then evolve it. Um, but then once you're in this sort of facultative state, then you have this ability to have it become more integrated. It can become into this very stable, integrated state. And so you can see these types of hypothetical models and use that with, uh, with the data that um, from, uh, you collect in the databases. So what this new approach allows us to ask is, what are the important evolutionary stages in symbiosis uh, transition that a symbiosis actually transitions through to get towards this more integrated state? Can these stages be linked with particular ecological events? So what this allows us to do is to see when a particular plant is in one of these particular stages and then correlate that with, um, let's say, cl major climactic events. And can we quantify the actual degree of integration? So here, let me give you an example of how this works. You've got this legume rhizobia symbiosis, right? And we know that it's evolved in thousands of plant species. And we see all different types of distinct morphologies. They all look very, very different. Different nodule types, diverse mechanisms by which the plant controls the bacteria, um, unique molecular crosstalk that allows the mutualism to evolve. The question that we're asking, are some of these more integrated? Are some of these symbioses more stable, more integrated than others? And can we actually quantify that level of integration? Can we actually put different uh, partnerships on this continuum? So why we're able to do this right now is that Zan um, et al. published this amazing uh, plant phylogeny of some 30,000 plant species in nature this year. Um, and it was, uh, it, here's, uh, this is this time calibrated molecular phylogeny. So now we have the basis upon which we can study a particular symbiotic trait, in this case, nitrogen fixation. So then what we can do is we can, co we can collate an incredibly large database that tells us the end result. Which of these plants have the nitrogen fixing symbiosis and which ones don't? And then you can here you can see when we added all of the data to the, to the tips, we can see, okay, the green are the, are the plants that evolved the symbiosis, and the orange, there's no symbiosis. And what we're interested in is trying to understand what's happening in these black lines. What is the process that leads to this final state where some plants evolve the symbiosis and some don't? Now, if we were to use sort of classical models of evolution, then um, where we just see one evolution rate, where it just goes from a non-symbiotic state to a symbiotic state, and we run these through um, our model testing, then it seems that this is a very poor model. But if we run these data through, um, through an HMR, this hidden rate model approach, and we use this heterogeneous model, um, we find that, there's, uh, that the model that uh, best describes these data is this heterogeneous model with two rate classes. So what does that mean? So it's very, very similar to what I just showed you, is that if you go from an ancestral non-fixing state, you have this very, very small chance, very small chance of evolving what we call the precursor, the ability then to become um, receptive to nitrogen fixation. But once you evolve into that precursor state, there's a lot of dynamic exchange about whether you're fixing or you're not fixing. And then what we see is that these fixers, they go into this state which we call the stable fixing state, where then the chances of losing the symbiosis become incredibly low. And so what that means is that this is a much more integrated state of the symbiosis. So we identified these four symbiotic stages, this ancestral, precursor, fixer, and stable. But what then you can do with these, with these different symbiotic states 
And here again, this is just to, to, uh, to stress that once you're in a stable, then the rates of loss of the symbiosis is really near towards zero. But then what you can do is actually put these different symbiotic states onto your phylogeny. So you can see when these major changes occurred in the evolution of this symbiosis. So for instance, here we've got um, in blue, this is all the, the ancestral state. Then you can see where the star is. There was some event that allowed this symbiosis to evolve, a single underlying event that allowed that to occur. And then you see it move into green, where there's lots of uh, plants that are fixing. And then what we're interested in is when it moves into the purple state, when the plants all of a sudden become, the symbiosis becomes so integrated that it's very, very stable and very difficult to lose. And so what's interesting about this approach is you can actually quantify the degree, the likelihood of each plant being in a particularly one of these four different states. You can quantify the likelihood of each of these plants in one of these different symbiotic states. So here, let me do a close-up here. If you were to do a close-up on this whole phylogeny, you can see all the different extant plant species and their likelihood of being uh, in the stable state towards 100% or just in the fixing state or being in the precursor state. There's many plants, for instance, that have just remained in the precursor state and never evolved the nitrogen fixing symbiosis. And of course, many that are just in the ancestral state never moved into the precursor state. But what we're interested in terms of understanding why symbiosis has become permanent is looking at these plants in the stable state. So here's just a few examples of, of hosts of legumes that have entered in to this, um, into this stable state. And what we see by the, in the parentheses is their likelihoods of being in these particular states. So for instance, Metacago, which is one of these model species, has a 99% likelihood of being in one of these stable symbiotic states. There's a very uh, little chance of losing the symbiosis. And again, what you can do is sort of make tables sort of showing all the different degrees of plants in the whole phylogeny of being in particular symbiotic states. So when we put all of that information on the phylogeny, we see that this move from a nitrogen fixing state to a stable fixer has 24 separate origins. So we're trying to uh, understand what are those separate origins? What do they represent? What do they mean? Are there any commonalities in those 24 different origins? If we look across this phylogeny again and say, are there, is there any commonalities in how these hosts evolved into this stable state? Another question we can ask is, what factors are correlated with evolutionary signatures of integration, right? So if we can, get, if we can quantify these plants, let's say Metacago has a 99% chance of being in this stable state, um, then we can look at particular factors, for instance, like uh, the seed end content. How much end content is in these seeds? Or are different life history traits? Are plants that are woody versus herbaceous more likely to be in the stable symbiosis state? Look at different nodule morphologies, right? Are there some sort of characteristics of these plants that make the symbiosis more stable? And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is control mechanisms. How do plants control these symbionts? And if you evolve into this more stable state, are you more likely to have um, more exact and control, uh, more precise control mechanisms um, that allow you, for instance, to discriminate between good fixing strains and bad fixing strains. So that leads me to the next part of this talk where, where um, what, what we're interested in is trying to understand is, is there any sort of degree, is there any difference in the way these plants in the stable state versus just the normal fixing state control their rhizobial partners? And now there's this idea, there's this ability of legume hosts to discriminate among rhizobia, um, allocating more resources to those that fix more nitrogen. And so the question we have is that these hosts that fall over this entire phylogeny, they've evolved these very sophisticated mechanisms to control rhizobial fitness. For instance, we know that they can control the oxygen, the amount of oxygen that are going to the, uh, the rhizobia, the controls of sugars. Um, there's some uh, plants that have evolved ways to keep 
uh, just one rhizobia per nodule. These are all control mechanisms that plants have evolved con to control uh, the resources to their symbiont. But do plants differ in their ability to control in these mechanisms? So here are just a couple of papers um, that have come out, some from, uh, from uh, Stephanie Porter and Joel Sachs, who are, who are in the audience who study this type of question as well, showing that if we look at legume hosts, they, they differ in their ability to control their symbionts, right? We see all different types of controls, whether it be at the pre-infection stage or at the stage where they are controlling the amounts of sugars that are going to the, um, to the symbiont. So we see that there's this, there's this whole array of, uh, of, um, of control. So if we know that, what we want to ask now is, do some plants have more control than others? Have some evolved more elegant controls over those bacterial symbionts? And is that any way, uh, are there any commonalities to the way that, let's say, animals control their endosymbionts? We know that under certain con uh, conditions, rhizobial uh, proliferate, and hosts are not always able to control the way these bacteria grow in their nodules. And so what we're trying to do right now is study the way these different legume hosts vary over a, 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 across a gradient of integration is basically how we're trying to study it. So these are all um, legume hosts that are considered into this stable phase. They're very good at controlling the resources to their rhizobia. But what would be on the complete opposite side of that? This is a new model system that we've just started working with that is a newly evolved mutualism that is um, the only example of a non-legume, it's a, it's a non-legume host to these rhizobia. And basically, it's called the Perisponia. Um, it's a Perisponia host. It's a tropical tree that is from the Malay archipelago. And this is a really interesting host to study when you're um, looking at host control over rhizobia because it's actually an opportunity to study control mechanisms in the really earliest stages of mutualism, mutualism evolution. So this is the most early stages, and it also provides this evolutionary replicate of how these mechanisms emerge to stabilize cooperation between rhizobia, and in this case, a non-legume host. So why Perisponia is interesting and allows us to study over this whole entire gradient of integration is because it differs very, very much from legumes in the way that it treats its rhizobial symbionts. For instance, um, the infection mode. When you have a rhizobia that's infecting a Perisponia, it, it tends to make it through this uh, intracellularly via a crack entry. So it's always intercellularly and not intracellularly. Where in legumes, you've got this beautifully elegant uh, root, root, you know, in, in some legumes, you also have the crack entry. But in some, they've evolved this incredibly elegant way that the, the root hair curls over um, a single rhizobial cell. We can look at symbiotic structure. And in Perisponia, we see um, these intracellular fixation threads and nodule cells, but the rhizobia always remain in contact with the apoplast, where in legumes, you've got these organelle-like structures, right? You've got these organelle-like structures called these symbosomes that are released into the nodule cells. So I'm not going to go through the whole, um, the whole table, but basically what, what you can see, some of them are really interesting in terms of... Um, for instance, the nodule form. This is great. So in, in Perisponia, uh, the nodules that form, they almost look like lateral roots that are just coming off the side of the main root. Whereas in legumes, they've evolved this very much more elegant uh, way that the vascular bundle actually surrounds this central zone, and it becomes much more part of the plant. Um, we see in Perisponia really high levels of promiscuity. It can be nodulated by many, many different rhizobia in different ge uh, genera. In legumes, you can have both very strict to highly promiscuous, but in, in uh, Perisponia, it's really promiscuous, the amount of rhizobia that can actually enter into the symbiosis. And in some cases, and this is what we're particularly interested in, is these mechanisms controlling the way that rhizobia interact with the host and um, in Perisponia, there's really no control mechanisms that have been shown experimentally yet. Um, there's, there's some idea that there's these phenolic, uh, phenolic compound-containing cells that may sort of 
decrease the amount of rhizobia, um, but, but it's very scarce evidence. Whereas here in the legumes, you've got these beautifully um, controlled um, ways in which the, the legumes actually um, can control the fitness of the rhizobia. And here's just a quick cross-section of what these two different nodules look like. We've got um, perisponia here and rhizobia there. And here you can see that the rhizobia, they're housed in these organelle-like structures called symbiosomes, where here in the perisponia, the rhizobia remain in the, in the fixation threads. So basically, the, the point of showing all of this is to, uh, is, is to stress that plants, and this is, I think, a really good model system for studying integration, is that plants can uh, form over this entire continuum of integration. And, uh, and we can look at different um, aspects of the way the, the host plant controls the symbiont and ask, well, what, what specific features evolve over time that allow the host to have much more strict control over the proliferation of the rhizobial symbiont. And I, I, I think when we think about this continuum, um, it's important to remember that in the legume rhizobia symbiosis, you still have this kind of enslavement, right? Where the rhizobia enter in, they form these nodules, but once they're inside the nodule, they have no other options open to them. So they're, they're a bit like an organelle, they are a bit enslaved. Whereas you have other options, like with the, with the mycorrhizal symbiosis, where the, where the partner, the microbial partner, retains all of its different options. For instance, it can, it can uh, make um, connections with multiple different host plants at once. And so this is sort of the most extreme example of a symbiont retaining power because it's never enslaved. It's always able to make connections with different uh, organisms. And we had a paper recently uh, this year in PNAS that was exploring the ways that different microbes retain that kind of power. So basically the opposite of being enslaved, how do microbes retain power where they're actually able to decide which partners they uh, choose to, to, to work with? So just to conclude, here are some of the questions that we're, that we're constantly asking in, in terms of looking at this integration continuum, asking, um, well, how is conflict reduced, right? How, how is conflict between these partners reduced? And how does this reduction in conflict lead to sort of major transitions towards, um, uh, towards becoming um, a, an organism that is integrated, that was originally two free living organisms. Can we quantify a gradient of integration? Can we actually put a number on this gradient of integration? And, uh, and lastly, can we select for integration? So this is just what, how I want to end, is by saying, is there a way where we can actually select for the way that um, microbes and symbionts become enslaved. And I think sort of the most obvious one, which people have been trying to do now for decades, is trying to introduce organelles like the, uh, like the nitrogen-fixing symbiosis into non-hosts. And this has been met with very, very little success, and I think it will still be met with very, very little success, because it's very difficult to integrate these types of, uh, of, of symbiosis. So how can we, another, uh, another interesting project that's coming out of, uh, out of Holland right now is enslaving microbes in a different way, um, using them, for instance, in 3D printing. So 3D printing furniture with microbes. And another sort of Dutch design thing that has just been recently introduced is this idea that Philips has come up with, with the microbial homes. This is a very, very, there are different ways of integrating uh, microbes. But here, the idea here is, is that um, micro microbes can be better integrated into the home in terms of uh, producing heat and producing gas and composting our vegetables. And here's a very sort of elegant picture of what it would look like, whereas in in uh, reality, it would look nothing like this. And, uh, and that's where I want to end. I wanted to thank my collaborators and, uh, and my funding. Thank you very much.